Hello, everybody. Welcome to part three of our reading of the Yoga Sutras. Usually, this is a recap of what we do on the Dark Outpost the day before, but if you're following along on the Dark Outpost and you know that we're a little bit off with the Dark Outpost on this channel, we're a little bit of ahead of where we are with David Zublik, and that is because each individual sutra in the Yoga Sutras opens doors for a lot of discussion. And since it's just me reading it here on this channel, I'm literally just talking to myself as you guys listen along. But of course, on the Dark Outpost, David is there to have that conversation. And it's interesting because as most of you know, I have been reading the Yoga Sutras for years and years and years and years now. It is definitely a book that you you reread if you are a student of yoga many, 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 many times. And for me, because I have been doing this for such a long time, and because I've been teaching for a long time, and I've had the opportunity to study in India, and all that kind of stuff, sometimes maybe I talk about topics in the Yoga Sutras that for a beginner might be a little bit over their head. And what's great with David is because David has never read the Yoga Sutras, he's able to ask those questions that I might miss um, when it comes to reading these sutras for people who are completely new to the teachings of the Yoga Sutras. Again, the reason why we're going through the Yoga Sutras, this was David's idea, and I'm so appreciative of it. Typically, we're reading through the missing books of the Bible, and we are going to be getting back to the missing books of the Bible. We'll be getting into the book of Enoch next. But David wanted to take a little break and read through the Yoga Sutras because, you know, here we are in this great awakening, and so many people, so many people have been fed propaganda about certain topics in order to conquer and divide because that's what the bad guys do. They infiltrate and they conquer and they divide. They make one group feel like they're superior to another group by casting the other group into this idea of being demonic or whatever. And the thing that we're learning with this Great Awakening is that we can't just judge people based on hearsay. We actually need to do the research ourselves. And a lot of the silliness I hear around yoga, the lot of, a lot of the things that people say, oh, it's demonic because of this, that, or the third, are just completely fabricated ideas. They've come from nowhere. They're just made up. And so the thing we want to do is actually go back to the source, which is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's all about how you need to be able to control your own mind. Don't allow the mind to control you. If you allow the mind to control you, then you're going to get yourself into situations that are not healthy for you, that are toxic, that can be somewhat violent. Instead, through the practice of yoga, we learn to understand our own attachment to thought and the way that thought actually works. Now, we're reading from, again, a commentary by Sri Swami Sachitananda. And a lot of the commentary makes this a lot longer to go through, but I actually enjoy commentary. I enjoy reading all sorts of commentaries on old subjects because it's interesting what is being drawn out of these sutras, these couple of sentences about the mind. Now again, we talked a lot about with the Yoga Sutras, the idea of the three elements that are kind of the main characters of the Yoga Sutras being Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishvara. Prakriti is nature. Prakriti is anything that has a birth, a life, and a death. And because of that, because of that rule that it goes in this cycle, this cycle, this circle of life, cue the opening song to the Lion King right there, because of that, it's always changing. Okay, and so Purusha then is that element of us that is eternal. You can call it the soul, you can call it Atman, whatever word you have for that eternalness inside all of us, inside animals, inside inside actual nature like trees, that's Purusha. And that Purusha, even though it's living within the expression, the Shakti of nature, is not actually a part of nature because it will depart from nature once the natural body has expired. Now, through the Yoga Sutras, we learn that man's suffering, the human condition, is because as man, through as human beings, we have this like misunderstanding about who we really are. We believe that who we really are is our nature. I, you know, I could say, okay, I am really Bryce, this girl from Georgia who was born in 1983, but that's only the identity I carry in this life. Who I really am is an eternal soul that is 
weaving in and out of this, this threads of, of Shakti or expression. And that eternal soul is what connects to God. So this very much connects back to the Gnostic teachings, um, the original Christians, who again were the Gnostics, the Nazarenes, they taught this, this inner knowing that your soul was not of this world, just your body was. And so with that being said, if you go way back to the foundation and the root of Christianity, you see a huge crossover between the Yoga Sutras and the teachings of Yahshua or Jesus. Now Ishvara, which is the third superstar of the Yoga Sutras, is God. That's basically the word for the Lord. Now, this um, we're using the Sanskrit words here. This is Sanskrit is is a dead language. It's just like Latin. It's just a dead language. It's not conjuring any spells. That's silly and that's really, really disrespectful and really, really ignorant. Sanskrit is an actual language that existed on this earth at one time, just like Latin. And a lot of the uh, languages of India now, like Hindi or Kannada or Igo, they are variations of Sanskrit, just as a lot of the European languages are variations of Latin. So Sanskrit is nothing more than a language. And so Ishvara is the word for like God, the Lord the higher power, whatever you call that, that thing that we label as God in the West, that's what Ishvara is. And so Ishvara is connected to the soul, a purusha of the person, whereas Prakriti is just the natural expression of that soul in the particular life, but it's not the actual identity of the soul. And so when we start to look at that, we look at the idea of the mind, the brain, that organ that's inside your skull. You know, we have the mind, then we have the psyche, then we have consciousness. We have all these different levels of awareness within our whole being. But the brain, the mind is an organ, just like the lungs, just like the heart, just like every, the liver, the kidneys, it's an organ. And the brain's purpose, its sole purpose is to solve problems for you and to keep you alive. And so sometimes when we don't understand that about the brain, when we think all of our thoughts are real, we start to get confused about who we really are. And we start to become attached to things that are not eternal and therefore have caused this human condition or suffering. And so we left off last week, we talked a lot about the idea of non-attachment, of being able to be passionate about something, to stand up for what's right, but also be at peace with the outcome of that and not attached to it. Okay, and so I know we left off at Sutra 26, last time we um, we met, but I'm going to go back to Sutra 25 again and just start there again to reread Sutra 25. In him, the complete manifestation of the seed of omniscience. So in him, so the him there is capitalized. So he's talking about Ishvara. All right. So now we go into the commentary by Sri Swami Satyananda. In other words, he is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. He is knowledge itself. The cosmic knowledge is called the supreme soul or parusha. So again, that divine spark, we've been talking a lot about that in reference to the original Christians, that they believed in this idea of a divine spark. We know in Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. Well, the original Hebrew word for that word light meant divine spark. So that's what that's the same thing that he's sp speaking about here, that this cosmic knowledge, this divine spark, this parusha that's inside of us is part of, of the supreme soul is part of that is what we call in the Christian world a child of God same thing how can we imagine or visualize it imagine a circle you see the space within the space outside of it the inner space is finite and the outer is infinite if you accept the existence of finite space automatically you have to accept an infinite one so finite space would be our bodies nature but infinite is something that doesn't ever die. Without infinite, there can be no finite. The moment you say, I am a man, then there must be a woman. If you say left, there must be a right. The thought of one implies the other. We feel that our minds and knowledge are limited and finite. So there must be a source of infinite knowledge beyond that. <laughs> Again, that kind of goes back to edio, outer knowledge, and gnosis or inner knowing. 
This also goes back to um, the Garden of Eden, the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. They are the yin and the yang, the opposite. You can't know, as we're learning in this great awakening, you can't know true goodness until you've been exposed to true evil. And unfortunately, one of the downsides of this great awakening is that we've had to not be blind to the pure evil around us as we know what that really is and what that really looks like now. So this brings us to Sutra 26. Unconditioned by time, he is the teacher of even the most ancient teachers. So the he in this is capitalized again. So we're referring to Ishvara or God. So unconditioned by time, he, God, is the teacher of even the most ancient teachers. Although, now this is the commentary, although all knowledge is within you and you need not get it from outside, somebody is still necessary to help you understand your own knowledge. This is why a teacher or a guru is necessary. He or she helps you go within and understand yourself. To help you, your guru must know something himself or herself. From where did your guru get that knowledge? It must have been learned from somebody else. There must be a chain of gurus. Then who is the first guru? There may, may be many hundreds of thousands of gurus, but there should be a primary one. There should be an infinite reservoir of knowledge from which all knowledge came in the beginning. That is why Patanjali says the Supreme Purusha Odishvara is the guru of gurus. And I love what he talks about here. So if you remember on the introduction of yoga, we talked about pratyahara, which we're going to get to in the second pada, which is the self-study. And that's one thing, um, you know, I, I teach sold out courses all the time here about um, for beginners that are wanting to start the Ashtanga practice. And um, a lot of my course involves going through the philosophy and how to apply it into the actual practice, the physical practice of yoga. And that's one thing I say a lot to my students, like I'm here to teach you the philosophy so that you can understand it. But an inner understanding of this philosophy has to come from you yourself. I can't do it for you. That gnosis has to be bloomed within you through you, not through me. I can only show you the steps to take to get there. One of the many practices. This is not the only practice to get that gnosis. It's just one of them, one of many. It's kind of like that saying, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. A yoga teacher, a guru, which is all guru means. A guru is just a master teacher. That's all it is. The guru is not going to save you. The guru is not going to give you any special talents. They're just a master teacher. And a good guru knows their boundaries and their limits when it comes to their students. My teacher in India is really respectful of boundaries and talking you through philosophy, but allowing you to be the one to make decisions for yourself because that's the path of understanding your own self, your own inner knowing. So Ishvara Pradidana is de or devotion to the all-knowing Ishvara is another method for attaining samadhi or oneness. It is the emotional path which is easier than the other me methods mentioned here. Just surrender yourself unto him saying, I am thine. All is thine, thy will be done. That moment you have resigned yourself to comply and you have transcended your own ego. So again, when you're wait, what he's saying, when you have that devotion, that continual devotion to God, and you're able to say, thy will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's in our prayers as Christians. Same thing. You're checking your ego out the door and you're allowing the natural flow of Ishvara, the necessary flow of Ishvara to come through and you're stepping aside from your own actions and allowing that to manifest itself. We try to practice yoga with our egos. Oh, I can concentrate. I can penetrate this object. I can empty my mind. All of these ideas of I can should become I can't. We should become completely resigned. When I say I can, we are speaking as part of nature. Once we say I can't do anything, it is you, Lord. We have risen above nature. That is simple and safe shortcut if you can do it. I love that. That really, even though he wrote this commentary for the sutras in the 1940s, that very much plays into what we're learning today. I think I had this conversation with Catherine Edwards. I can't remember if we had it on camera or off camera, 
But you know, everything that happened over the last couple of years with Mr. T, with the alliance, whatever you want to call it, was just a means to an end because we we're waiting for the God moment. And we know that at the end of the day, this is divine timing for God. And that in itself, what we're experiencing in this great awakening, having to wait for the God moment is a practice of yoga and meditation in itself. Ultimately, nobody can achieve eternal peace by doing something with the mind, which is part of nature. Ding, ding, ding. There you go. Your peace is not going to come from your own mind because your mind is part of nature. It's always changing and it's going to eventually perish one day. So there has to be something inside of you that can control the mind so that you can find that inner peace. That supreme joy can only be acquired when you rise above nature by complete surrender. When you transcend nature and understand God in his transcendental state, once you transcend, you know that you were never involved with nature big or small. You are completely pure and free. Then you become one with the transcended God. In that state, you can say, I and my father are one. You can never say that Mr. So-and-so with 150 pounds of flesh and bones and 5'6 height and curly hair, which I can I say, I and my father are one, the pure I, who is uninvolved and free from nature. That freedom comes once you surrender yourself completely to God. In our ordinary lives, we have yoga, union with nature, but now we want yoga with God. We have union always, but our union with Prakriti should be changed to union with God. Union with God is the real yoga. So now you can see the connection between the devotional side of the religious teachings and yoga. There is no difference between religion and yoga. Yoga is the basis of all religions. With the light of yoga understanding, you could walk even into the difficult corners of the scriptures and understand every religion well. And Richard Freeman actually says that in his video, Yoga Ruins Your Life, which I'll attach that in the description box below where he says, I'm paraphrasing what he says, but something along the lines of when you become deeply involved in your yoga practice, the restraints of religion just don't, don't appeal to you anymore because you've found the essence of what all religion is trying to get to. And that's that inner oneness with God. You know, and a lot of times, even carrying the label, like he was just talking about having the label, like I'm, what, 5'4", 110 pounds, 38 years old. That's That me is not the me that is going to be interwoven with God. The me that's going to be interwoven with God is my soul, is my spirit. That has nothing to do with the physical manifestation of that spirit, but the pure spirit itself. And so once you understand that concept, then these dogmatic evils that we see in the world uh, tended to go away because I don't feel the need to chastise somebody because their religion is different from mine because I can see and understand that their pure soul transcends beyond that religion and into that connection as God with God as well because we are all children of God. You start to see that reflected in every single person whether they're Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or Christian, whatever the case may be, you start to appreciate them as well for their pure soul, whether they know they have a pure soul or not. All right, number 27. The word expressed of Ishvara is the mystic sound Om. So this is um, interesting, and I know people are going to find maybe find this interesting, and this might be where a lot of people think, Get, misunderstand the practice of yoga. So the chanting of Om, if you're ever out in nature by yourself, like deep in nature away from any type of traffic or, or city or electricity, you and you sit quietly and just listen, you will hear a vibration of Om. It's the vibration of nature. And we know that we are energy. We know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed. That's why we know we're eternal. And so the energy of God is resonated in that Aum sound, okay? That's why Aum is chanted a lot in yoga is because it's trying to find that vibration within your body that can perhaps wake up that spark within you that is God's child. All right, so let's go into the commentary now. Because it is difficult to understand anything without a name, Patanjali wants to give the Supreme Purusha a name. Even if he doesn't have a particular form, he should have a name. 
But Ishvara is a limited name. God is also limited because the very vibration of the letters are limited. So Patanjali wants a name that can give an unlimited idea and vibration, which can include all vibrations, all sounds and symbols, because God is like that, infinite. So Patanjali says his name is Om. We can easily say Om, so it's written O-M. O-M is called Pranava, which simply means humming. But you need not hum to feel God's presence. If you hum, it is as if you are trying to create God or bring him into you. There is no need to create him, but just to feel him in you. If you close your eyes and ears and sit quietly, allow the mind to be constantly silent and then listen within, you will hear him humming. He talks to us always, but we talk so loud, we fail to hear his speech. And that's interesting because Shanti says this a lot and I agree with her. God doesn't speak in big, loud, booming voices. God speaks in a whisper. And I know Stephanie has come to this realization, a realization that I came to many, many years ago. You know, we're taught constantly in the Christian church to pray, 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 pray. But when you're praying, you're the one doing the talking. You're the one constantly talking. However, when you meditate, when you sit back, then you can listen. And you learn a whole lot more about yourself and about God's love, if you just shut up for a minute and listen. Here we also have to understand why we should give a name to something. In Sanskrit, there is a term, padarta. Colloquially, it means thing, but literally it means the pada and the artha, the thing in its meaning. The name and the form of a thing are inseparable. When you want to express a thought, you have to put it into words. Without words, you can't convey what you are thinking. So every thought or substance should have a name to express it. This is why we have a name for everything in the world. But in the normal sense, a name may mean something, but it can't convey the exact nature of that thing. For example, when I say apple, we all know what an apple is, but we are able to visualize the, stuff, the substance behind the name. But if a person has never seen or heard of an apple, the word cannot convey anything. She cannot create a picture from the word itself. She may even wonder who this apple is. It has only become the name of the fruit through usage. And this is big too, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine, which is the sister science to yoga, the three elements of life are breath, food, and vibration. And of course, speaking, our words are vibration. And if you come into a traditional yoga class, especially people like us who study in India, and sign contracts with schools in India to bring the teachings to our prospective countries, you're never going to hear us call any of the yoga postures by their English translations. We're always going to be calling them by their Sanskrit names because the Sanskrit vibration of that name is the vibration of the action of the alchemy of the posture. And so by calling the posture by its English name, you're doing a huge disservice, huge disservice to yourself and to your students. And that's that's why. It's, it's the thing and the name that create that magical alchemy of healing and self-knowing, self-realization. All right. But God's designation should not be like that. There are hundreds and thousands of names for God, but none of them convey the exact idea of God. They may give a picture of one aspect of God, but not in his fullness. God is, was, and always will be, without beginning or end, infinite and omnipresent. For such a great one, there should be a name that conveys those same ideas. And not only that, but by repeating it in the very name should manifest God's light in you. The name chair can remind you of a chair, but you can't sit on it. Sugar can remind you of something sweet, but you can't taste it. But God's name should not only denote the fullness of God, and itself represent him, it should also bring him to you. And such a name cannot be anything but Om. So for people who are just starting out, that's a good exercise. Now, when I do chanting, because a lot of times chanting too, um, I have a very, very broad, uh, deep Vedic chanting practice myself that is private to me. Um, 
But if you're just starting, chanting, the vibration of chanting calms the mind down. That's another reason for chanting is it calms that mind down. And I do that before I start practicing to get my mind prepared for the practice. But if you're just starting this, something you can do, a very easy, easy practice is take five or 10 minutes of your day, sit somewhere quiet, shut the door, lock the door if you have to, follow your breath, find that easy flow of breathing and then just start chanting om over and over and over again you can even find recordings on youtube of people chanting om to help you get started if you want to play the recording with you to help you kind of find that rhythm and then over time turn it off and do it by yourself it's a great place to start it's a very easy place to start please do not think that i am hindu and that hindu scriptures say this so that is what i'm saying i don't belong to any particular religion but all the scriptures indicate this. The Bible says in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And in the Hindu Vedas, it says the name of Brahman is Om, and Om is Brahman himself. Why do they, they say this Om is so rich, so deep, and capable of representing the omnipresent, endless, beginningless God? Same thing, right? Same thing. Christians and Hindus are no different. It's the same thing. Let us see why this is so. The name Om can be split into three letters, A-U-M. That's the, actually the correct spelling. So you see it mostly spelled O-M, but you will in more traditional scriptures see it spelled A-U-M, Aum. And that is why it's often written as A-U-M. The entire Manduka Upanishad expounds the meaning of Om. There it divides Om into four stages, A-U-M and Anagata or the one that is beyond verbal pronunciation. A is the beginning of all sound. Every language begins with the letter A or A. Ah. A is pronounced by simply opening the mouth and making a sound. The sound is produced in the throat where the tongue is rooted. So audible sounds begin with A or A. Ah. Then as the sound comes forward between the tongue and the palate up to the lips, U or U is produced. Then closing the lips produces the M or um. So the creation is A, the preservation is U, and the culmination is M or um. So um includes the entire process of sound, and all other sounds are contained in it. Thus, om um is the origin or the seed from which all other sounds and words come. In other words, om um is dormant in all other words. That goes back down to vibration, to gematria, the living sound, the living energy tangible through speech. After the verbal sound ends, there's still a vibration. That is the unspoken or the anagata sound, which has always been in you, even before saying the A and after finishing the M. There is always sound vibration in you that can never be destroyed. You can always listen to that sound if you remain quiet. For the reason this is also called a japa, or unrepeated. Japa means repetition, but a japa is that which is needed not to be repeated. This is always going on within. It is heard only when all the other sounds cease. Even thinking creates sound, because the thought itself is a form of speaking. By thinking, you distort the original sound which transcends the beginning, continuation, and the end of the om sound. To listen to that sound, you have to keep your mind quiet. Stop the thinking process and dive within. Then you will be able to listen to that hum. Again, this goes back to Gnosis. As Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. Again, Yahshua, Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. It's not outside of you. It's not in the church. It's not in the temple. It's not in the mosque. It's not in the government building. It's not in the grocery store or in your school or even in your home. It's within your very being. And if we can just get that mind to shut up for a minute, to be quiet, we can actually hear that, that we've never been without God. God is always always been with us again genesis 1 3 god said let there be light let there be a divine spark and genesis 1 4 says god saw the light and it was good so he separated it from the darkness god has always been within you 
that was a huge message of Yahshua as well. Why are you going to these religious leaders? Remember, Yahshua did not like the religious leaders. Yahshua, John the Baptist, his cousin, they were constantly, constantly, constantly calling out the religious leaders for manipulating the people and saying, hey, stop this. God's inside of them. You cannot manipulate them because they are children of God. That is what yoga is telling you as well. It's all inside of you. It's all inside of you. All right. The hum is called a pranavaya because it is connected with prana. Prana, again, is life force. Prana is the basic vibration, which always exists, whether it is manifesting or not. It is never ending. It is something like in our waking state when we think, speak, and act. Whereas in the sleeping condition, the mind seems to keep quiet. But actually, even in the sleeping state, movement is still there. Vibration is still there in the mind and is unmanifested condition. Scientifically, we can say that when manifested objects are reduced to their unmanifested condition, they go back to the atomic vibration. Nobody can stop the atomic vibration. We say that animate objects move while inanimate object ones do not because it appears that way to our eyes. We can't see any motion in a stone, but that does not mean it is motionless. We need not to go to the scriptures. The scientists themselves have proven that. So one little thing about prana as well that reminded me, I don't know if we've spoken about this before. Another misunderstanding people have about yoga is something called the sun salutations. Um, ignorant people um, who choose not to research this, who just want to believe what their deceitful mind is telling them, or the hearsay that they hear from other people, think that sun salutations are people worshiping the sun. That is not true at all. It's actually kind of funny and laughable how ignorant that is. So prana is upward moving energy as we just spoken about prana and there's lots of different elements of energy within your body. But the two main energies are what we call prana and apana. Prana is upward rising energy, the eternal energy. Apana is downward flowing energy. So something that is aponic has the downward flowing energy. Women are aponic. We have babies. We have our lower body is stronger than our upper body. We are downward energy. Uh, women are affected by the moon. Our cycles run on a moon. That's where we get the word month from moon. So when we're talking about aponic energy, oftentimes the symbol for aponic energy is the moon. Okay? So with the opposite, with prana, the upward rising energy, that's the sun. Prana is, is most easily um, executed by men, by the, the male energy. Okay, so women have a monthly cycle because we're aponic. Men have a pranic cycle, which is about every three months. Uh, a man will get his like man period. So you might notice your husband or your boyfriend uh, gets a little moody, a little bitchy every three months. That's because they're, it's on their, they're probably on their cycle. You know, as women, we have actual tangible evidence to show us we're on our cycle, but for men, they don't. And so it's just a, a hormonal switch that goes through that solar cycle. Well, even men and women both carry both prana and aponic energy. For, for example, for a, men to do, for a man to do something aponic would be something like going to the bathroom. Like that's an aponic energy, right? Pushing down. Um, but we, we carry elements of both. Our just dominant energy is different from each other. So when we come into our physical asana practice, our posture practice of yoga, in order to um, turn the body on, to get the, the life force to kind of wake up, especially so early in the morning when you traditionally practice, we do what we call our sun salutations or Surya Namaskar. So the sun, Surya in this, is prana. It's not talking about the literal sun. It's talking about your chi, your life force, waking your life force up. And then Namaskar is a greeting. It's like aloha. It's like saying hello. So you're literally, what a sun salutation means is literally waking the life force of the body up. Okay. In the gym, if you're a gym rat, this is your warm up. This is you getting your body nice and hot and warm, creating, starting to create that friction. You know, when we're in the sun salutations, um, in our practice, that's how we start our practice, you can start to actually feel the blood pumping. And that again, gets the mind ready and the body ready and, and, um, ample, um, to do 
the work that's in front of you. And so that's what the sun salutations mean, guys. It's nothing about worshiping the sun at all. It has nothing to do with the actual sun. It's all about internal energy. All right. So, similarly, even without you repeating it, the basic sounds always vibrating in you. It is the seed from which all other sounds manifest. That is why Om represents God in the fullest sense. It has the power to create everything. If you make an apple out of clay, paint it beautifully and put it on the table with a real apple, an ordinary person cannot see the difference between the clay apple and the real one. They look alike and have the same name, but if you plant them both, your clay apple will not create an apple tree, but the real one will. The true apple has the creative capacity within itself because the seed is in there. How? Did, wow, that's definitely a metaphor for what's happening with the people of the dark versus the people of the light. As I've said many times, darkness cannot create. That's why it has to feed off the light because only light can create. Only that which carries the seed of God can create. It's a perfect example of what we've spoken about a lot on this channel and other topics regarding the battle that's going on right now in our world. Likewise, other words are just like the clay apple. While the seed word om has the creative capacity to manifest the entire world, the entire world evolves from that and goes back into that again. That is why God's name should be om. No other name can be more adequate to represent him. We should also understand that om was not invented by anybody. Some people didn't come together, hold nominations, take a vote, and majority declared, all right, let God have the name om. No, he himself manifested as Om. Any seeker who really wants to see God face to face will ultimately see him as Om. That is why it transcends all geographical, political, or theological limitations. It doesn't belong to any one country or one religion. It belongs to the entire universe. It is a variation of this Om that we see in the Christians, Muslims, and the Jews. That doesn't mean that someone changed it. Truth is always the same. Wherever you sit for meditation, you will ultimately end in experiencing Om or the hum. But you want to express what you experienced. You may use different words according to your capacity or language you know. For example, if some children hear somebody fire a gun and come running to their mama, one might cry, Mama, Mama, I heard a big sound, a boom. Another child will say, No, Mama, Mama, it went doop. Oh, Mama, Mama, I heard a big bang. The third child will say, it's, It isn't doom dupe or bang, these are all different versions of the same sound as heard by different children. Likewise, if you sit and meditate and go deep into the cosmic sound, you may say, oh, I heard it as this or that. Or another will say, I heard it as this. A third will say, um. A fourth will say, mm. This is why the Upanishads say, ikam sat vip raha bahudaha vedanti. The truth is one. Seers express it in many ways. I love that. The truth is one. Seers express it in many ways. I believe that. Nothing has confirmed that more to me during this great awakening. The truth is the same. The truth throughout all these different flavors of religion are just different flavors of the same truth that is God. So here we have learned the greatness of the basic seed word, Om. No other name can be more suitable than this for the Supreme. And now, having expressed its greatness, Patanjali continues by saying, that now this is Sutra 28, to repeat it with reflection upon its meaning is an aid. Here we come to the practice of japa. So many of you might have heard of japa meditation. Todd is a very powerful japa meditation teacher. If you are in the Atlanta area and you want to learn japa meditation, we have a course that is starting on uh, December 5th at Ashtanga Yoga Atlanta at my boyfriend's Shala, his yoga school. He's going to be teaching that course, a Japa Meditation and Vedic Chanting course. If that's something you're interested in, you do have to be here in the city. We don't do anything over Zoom. Um, we believe in teaching face-to-face -face when it comes to this stuff because that's how it is transmitted. The knowledge is transmitted, transmitted is face-to-face -face with people, so you do have to be in Atlanta to take that course. But if you are close to Atlanta and you're interested, I will place a link to our website down in the description box below so you can inquire about it more if that's something you are interested in. All right, so here we come to the practice of japa. It is a very powerful technique and at the same time, the easiest, simplest, and the best. Almost every religion advocates the repetition of God's name because all the prophets, sages, and saints experienced and understood its greatness, glory, and power. 
That is why in the Hindu system, a mystic word or mantra is given to the student to repeat. The meaning of mantra is that which keeps the mind steady and produces the proper effects. Its repetition is called japa. So japa yoga is communion with God through the repetition of his name. In the Catholic religion, you see the Joppa of Hail Mary practice with the aid of the rosary. And in the Greek Orthodox Church, I was surprised to see that Joppa is their constant practice also. They repeat, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, continuously. In the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, Joppa is a predominant practice. And I've noticed that. That's something I say all the time. There's no difference between mala beads and a rosary. They're the same thing. I have mala beads that I use in my practice when I do anything like Japa meditation that I move the bead from bead to bead. Mala beads are not things you wear. You don't wear mala beads. It's not jewelry. It's like a rosary. It's something you keep very private to you and you use it. You can rub it between your hands as you go from bead to bead to bead while you repeat whatever japa, whatever med repetitive med mantra or meditation that you have. That can be Om Nava Shivai, um, Om Ganapatiye, whatever that is. It can be simply like the Greek Orthodox Church, Lord Jesus have mercy on me, or let's just, you know, help me God. Whatever it is that you need to repeat in order to catch the vibration of the essence of that prayer, that's what you use. It's all the same thing. It is literally the same thing. We say it's the easiest because you need not go to a particular place nor have a particular time for it. It is not somewhere outside of you, but always within. Wherever you are, your mantra is with you. To worship a form, you have to have a picture or image and a place to keep it. But in mantra practice, it is always in your heart, the most sacred place, because, because it is your beloved. And that's why your mantra is to be kept sacred and secret. You don't even... You don't even reveal it to others, least you lose the reverence for it. And I have practiced that form of meditation before where I was given a mantra that I was never supposed to tell anyone. This was many years ago. I've since dropped that meditation for other meditations, but I still have never repeated that mantra that I was given to anyone because um, that is a sacred, it's reverence, it's your own, it's nothing, it's not witchcraft. There's no spell casting going on. It literally just keeps it sacred and personal to you. I mean, even when you do pray, think about prayers. A lot of times our prayers are personal. We don't tell people everything we pray about because it's so personal. Same thing with some mantras. By repeating it constantly, a part of the mind gets linked to that. It is like a person who goes down into a tunnel with a life rope tied around the waist and one end of the rope fixed to the pegs outside of the tunnel. Wherever there is any danger, he can just shake the rope and get pulled out. In the same way, a part of your mind is tied to God through your mantra, while the other part is engaged in worldly pursuits. You dive deep to get all the pearls you want to gather a name, fame, money, position, friends, anything you want. You need not stay away from anything as long as you do not lose hold of the rope. So as long as you keep your vibration of God within you, everything else can come and go. You're going to be fine as long as you keep God within you. A sensible climber sees to that first and even pulls it in a few times to see whether it is strong enough. Only after making sure does he begin to climb. But alas, many people do not bother about any rope. It is a golden cord between you and the Lord or the cosmic forces. Do not bother about the meaning in the beginning. Let the repetition become a constant habit. When it becomes a firm habit, then you can think, what am I repeating? Then you will be able to think of the meaning without forgetting the repetition itself because it has become a habit already. Most things happen by habit in our lives. 12 o'clock means lunch, 6 o'clock dinner. Just by the clock, things have become habits. Because we repeat something so often, it becomes second nature to us. In the same way, God's name can also be mechanically or habitually created in the beginning until finally it absorbs you and you become that. If you repeat war, 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 one day you will be at war. Think monkey, 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 and probably within a week or two, you will be jumping here and there. Yes, as you think, so you become. Ding, 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 right? How many of us have figured that out? Knowingly or unknowingly, you imbibe the qualities of that thing named. That's why so many people talk about keeping gratitude journals, about writing down, even when you've had a bad day, every night just thinking about five things that day that you're grateful for. And it could have be something just as simple as you had a really great lunch. 
It tasted really good. I just had a really great lunch. Let me tell you guys, I have this habit sometimes of forgetting to eat. That's just part of me. That's part of my vata dosha. And when I get extremely stressed out about something, I will go days without eating. And it's not that I... Um, I'm intentionally doing it. My stomach gets, I get hungry, but I just, the thought of eating just makes me want to puke. Um, that's just me as a vata. And so today I woke up and I've, I've, I have the propensity to get really thin and it's not cute. It's not attractive. And last night I was having a hard time sleeping because my ribs, it was hurting my bones. And I knew that because of the stress I've been under, um, that I, I have not been able to eat and I exercise a lot. And I've, I know that I was just getting a little too thin. And so before I started recording this, I actually ordered myself a really great lunch and it was really, really good. And I ate the whole damn thing because my body needed it. And so that's something that in a time of stress, I can write down and be like, I was so freaking grateful for that lunch from Panera because it tasted really good. And now my body feels better because it's actually gotten some nutrients in it. You know, it's just simple stuff like that. You know, another thing I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for my dog. My dog, I love my dog so much. Y'all know I'm an animal lover, but my dog is my soulmate. I just, he is the funniest little boy. And I just love him so much. And even though sometimes when he flops his body down on top of mine in the middle of the night, it can get kind of uncomfortable and somewhat painful. But at the end of the day, I'm so grateful that that little baby boy loves me back. I'm grateful for Todd. I'm grateful for the home we have. I'm grateful for the fact that I have a practice and that I have a YouTube channel. There's so much you can start writing down even under times of intense stress. And we're all under intense stress right now. We're all under like... Some, I'm sure most of us are going to come out of this with a little bit of PTSD from everything we've been through these last few years and watching the world around us crumble, which is what we want, but it's also scary because we don't know, we don't know anything other than this. And so we're having to come into uncharted territory together. But despite all of that, we can continue to put out that vibration of gratitude, of being grateful, thankful, loving to other people. When someone's nasty to you, make it a point to be extra loving to other people around you, to change that in that the vibration of that energy. Um, and that's what he's saying here, and it's so freaking true. You know, if, if you're all doom and gloom all the time, then all you're going to experience is doom and gloom. Again, Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. He also said, behold, the kingdom of hell is inside of you. You get to choose that. Do you want the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of hell inside of you? The power is all yours. It's always been yours. The power has never been outside of you, only within you. All right. That is why the right name has to be selected. Any word could help you keep the mind focused, but some names might lead you into difficulty later on. A holy name, which will alleviate your mind, should be taken as a mantra. For a spe special benefit, a special mantra is called for. But the basis of them all is om, just as cotton is the basis for cloth, which is then cut in different designs according to its purpose. A pillowcase, a bedsheet, a tablecloth, or a napkin. Om is the basic seed. For difficult purposes, you use different mantras, which are all part of a parcel of the original cosmic sound vibration, Om. You can use the same sound or power to bring harm or good. The people who do magic are also using mantric power. So you can make or break, bless or curse with your words. In fact, at no other time has the power of the word been more exhibited than in this 20th century. Politicians get elected by the power of their words. The power of words can be clearly seen in the present-day advertisements. Even in a worthless product can be made seen the best by clever words. So the power of the word can be misused also. This is why even before you handle these words, you should have a purity of mind. So in Japa, you repeat the word and later on feel the meaning also. I'll tell you something funny about India. I should do a whole show just on things that have happened to me in India because it's quite comical. Uh, my first trip to India, I was having some really bad stomach issues. Actually, every trip to India, I end up having a little bit of deli belly when I first get there. I'm sensitive, so I always go, I when I travel to India, I always go a week or two before I'm supposed to start my classes or start doing foundation work or whatever, whatever, because I just need my body, give my body a couple of weeks to adjust and to adapt to India. And my first trip, I was having such a hard time with like deli belly. I was having a hard time. It was another time when I just like stopped eating because everything was making me just vomit. And I just really just, it was a bad situation. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to go down to the local 
what would be the local grocery store loyal world is what it's called and I was like I think they have some coca-cola I'm gonna get a couple of coca-colas because that'll help calm my stomach um, you know it's not the super healthiest thing in the world but it's it's I know it will calm my stomach so I get a rickshaw down to loyal world and I get to loyal world and there's no coca-cola and so I asked the lady one of the ladies working there if if there was if they had any coke any coca-cola and um, and she was like, oh no, madam, finished. It's finished. Well, I didn't understand that in India, um, saying something is is finished or done meant that it's just out. I thought she meant like like there's no more Coca Cola. It's finished. Like it's out of business. And I was like, wait a minute. No, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm from the home of Coca Cola. Half of my friends work for Coca Cola. It is not finished. That business is not finished. It is still going powerful. And it took me a while to realize she just meant that they were out. Um, so again, words words are important. So if you ever go to India and someone tells you it's finished, it just means they're out. All right. So this brings us to Sutra 29. From this practice, all the obstacles disappear, and simultaneously dawns knowledge of the inner self. That's powerful. You get in tune with cosmic power. By that tuning, you feel that force in you. Embody all those qualities. Get the cosmic vision, transcend all your limitations, and finally become that transcendental reality. Normally, the mind and body limit you. But by holding something infinite, you slowly raise yourself from the finite objects that bind you and transcend them. Through that, you get rid of all the obstacles and your path is made easy. This probably reminds Patanjali of the different obstructions on the way, so he goes on to explain them next. And so I think that's where we're going to leave off today, which brings us to uh, Sutra number 30 um, in Book 1, which is the Samadhi Pada, uh, if you're following along with us in the Sri Swami Satyadananda uh, commentary. So again, we're going to leave off with 30. I'll probably start again next week just reading... Uh, Sutra 29 again just to refresh us on where we left off again if you are I've gotten so many people it's so cool so many people have um, messaged me about wanting to start yoga practices and wanting to find a teacher as I said on David Dublick show and as I have said on this show too on my own show because the type of yoga that I teach is traditional yoga I cannot be your teacher unless you are here in Atlanta, Georgia. I have to be able to see you, or Todd has to be able to see you in a person one-on-one. -on -one. There are some yoga practices you can find on YouTube, but for the traditional practices, you actually need to be seen by a teacher. And I am more than happy to help anybody find a teacher. If, if I see your email, if I can get in touch with me, I'm more than help, happy to look through your city and see if I can find people that have a good resume. Just I'll just have to go off the resume because I don't know all of them personally um, for you to try. But you know, the thing about these spiritual practices too is we have to like kiss a a lot of frogs before we find the prince right and there's so many different lineages of yoga and there's and sometimes you know the type of yoga that I practice is a very very difficult form of yoga it's very physically challenging I've injured myself so much I mean it's, it's very challenging and that's why it's not the most popular form of yoga because it's extremely uncomfortable and you have to be dedicated and want this to be able to maintain this discipline and so, but when I first started practicing yoga, if I had started with traditional yoga, I probably would not have eventually found, continued and found traditional yoga because it would have been so intimidating. And so sometimes we do have to kind of stumble along and try out different classes, try out different teachings until we find the one that works for us in the moment. And then sometimes that moment changes and we have to go for more of a traditional approach or whatever that might be. And with that being said, that is something you're a journey you're going to have to go on yourself you know you're going to have to find that and be brave and have that courage to go uh, and try different classes and talk to different teachers and and be willing to have your mind changed on different things and just do what works for you what feels right for you now in saying that one of the biggest misconceptions about yoga is that you're supposed to go to yoga to relax and get comfortable and that's not true at all yoga is actually kind of like this controlled um, uncomfortableness you're in, a, in a, again in a controlled environment you are supposed to get triggered in a controlled environment because it's your own 
exploration, you're, you're your own scientist, you know, exploring that pratyahara, exploring yourself. But over time, especially as you start to create your own autonomy and you understand your body more and you understand the magical side of your body more, that your body isn't just joints and flesh and organs, that there is an energetic body too that is really the main source of the body that's kind of dictating what happens in the physical. And that's something you learn over time. But the more you start to to connect to that within yourself, you're not going to need um, as much advice from people. You're going to be able to pave your own way, your own path, and find your own teaching. You always need a teacher. Everybody always needs a teacher. I have a teacher um, to keep you, uh, make sure your ego isn't playing tricks on you. But over time, you'll be able to be more self-aware and self-educated to not need guidance in finding a teacher, if that makes sense. Good teachers are not going to try to own you. They're going to hold you accountable to the work, but they're not going to like get involved in your life outside of the yoga shala. That's something that uh, we're really strict about at our shala is I will help you with the philosophy. If you have anything you're dealing with in your life and you want advice as a senior, senior teacher or whatever here, I would talk to you about the philosophy of yoga and the perception that yoga would have on dealing with certain obstacles or issues in your life. But at the end of the day, and we make this very clear with our students, we're not therapists and we're not doctors. And so the only thing we can do is talk to you through the philosophy of yoga. But as far as like talk therapy or medical um, therapy, you need to see someone that that has those that training within their wheelhouse, um, and that's something that I think uh, sometimes yoga students will like cling to their teacher, like their teacher is just the end all be all when it comes to to this practice. They start to lionize their teacher, and that's not something you should ever do. I don't lionize my teacher in India. I don't lionize him. I respect him. I listen to everything he says. I take everything he says to heart. I take notes on things he says in conferences, but I don't lionize him. He's a man. He's a man that has more experience than me. Um, that and that's why I go to him and learn from him. But he's still just a human being. If I, you know, need talk therapy or trauma therapy, I'm going to go to my trauma therapist. You know what I'm saying? So you have to have that kind of that sovereignty to be able to, as Aristotle said, it's a talent to be able to entertain ideas without accepting them. That's part of that autonomy and that sovereignty to be able to like entertain ideas, not necessarily accept accepting them right away. And part of that comes from the yoga practice. Um, so many different teachers out there that put their, I mean, the teachings all the same. It's just different teachers put their own spin and perceptions on the, their teachings given by what they've experienced in their own practices. Um, and so I really want to express that, that I will be more than happy to help you find a teacher. But in this path of coming on yoga, you're probably going to have many teachers until you find the one that really resonates with you. And that is perfectly fine. And I encourage you to try different lineages and try different teachers and try different things before you just settle on one. Um, also with the Yoga Sutras, if, if you are seriously considering doing a daily yoga practice, I would really encourage you to get yourself a copy of the Yoga Sutras. Uh, there's many different commentaries. Again, I'm reading from Sri Swami Satchitananda's commentary. A link to that will be in the description box below. That's one of my favorite commentaries. Um, but this is something you will read over and over and over again at many years into your practice because sometimes things you didn't understand at first will all of a sudden start to make sense more and more years into your practice. So there are things I'm reading right now that make perfect sense to me as I'm reading them that that might not make sense to you yet. Uh, that's just because maybe you haven't started practicing yet. And so give yourself time, get a copy of the Yoga Sutras, get yourself time, and give yourself patience as you work through this um, this philosophy. So with that being said, guys, I hope that you are, you're all enjoying the Yoga Sutras. I'm so, again, so... Um, Grateful to David Zublick that he's given me this opportunity on his channel to read through the Yoga Sutras so we can start to get rid of misinformation about yoga and stop this silly, 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 disgusting lie that yoga is demonic. It's just a lie. That's all it is. It's a lie that's created to conquer and divide. And it, yoga is about God. It's all about God. So thank you guys so, so, so much. I hope that you're having a fantastic week. I know here in America we have Thanksgiving next week. Um, I'm planning some stuff for next week. We are going to be traveling, but hopefully we'll get um, videos out to you guys even while I am traveling. So once again, tomorrow is Thursday. So tomorrow I will be on with uh, Charlie Ward at 5 o'clock in the morning, my time. I'm sure that will go up a little bit later after we have filmed. And then at 10 a.m. I'm going to be on a new show, which... Um, 
gonna be awesome. I'm super excited. And then at 3 p.m., I think it's three. Let me double check here. Yes, 3 p.m. I will be back on with Jean Claude uh, over at Beyond Mystic. Jean Claude is definitely becoming one of my favorite people to work with. I just think he's so cool. So I'm super excited to be back on with him. So anyway, all right, guys. I hope you have a great day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.